last time we talked about the idea of um, anthropomorphized. Is that the right word? <laughs> I think it no, is. Ro- yeah. Robopromorphized. <laughs> Robopromorphized. <laughs> Yes, um, uh, creatures, creatures running around anyway, doing doing jobs for us, doing tasks for us. And where where do we go from here then? That's right. So yeah, um, yeah. Last time, as you say, we had I made up this uh, robot thing, which really came from like a nineteen eighties book that I had as a kid, and lots of us did. That, that showed how computers worked by showing how robots moved around and did things inside. And we had this idea of a robot with a little abacus, which was his way of doing any arithmetic that you asked of him. And he had only a very limited amount of resources available to him. He had a little card that he had the, like, the most recent number that he worked on, the accumulator. And he had a little tag that he could use to say where he was. And where he was was in this big set of pigeonholes, which it occurs to me, most folks these days probably don't know what a pigeonhole is. Um, so is that? Yeah. it's like the mailboxes in like a shared apartment. You know, you've got this big grid of boxes and, you know, you can say, well, this number is for address zero. And we said addresses last time as well. Addresses are like the, which number box we're looking in. And inside each of those boxes, we can put one of these pieces of card that has a number on it as well. And we were, we were able to use that to build pretty much anything. And right at the end, we showed that the very program, the instructions to the robot could be put inside those pigeons holes itself, which then kind of like completes the circle, if we like. But I glossed over a lot of things. And so today... I'd like to talk a little bit about how maths is done inside the computer and how we can sort of solve the problem of carrying on forever. Last time, we talked about this accumulator where the robot could write numbers on and do maths with his abacus. And that's all cool and all, but really, there's a limited amount of resources that the robot has. He can't write arbitrarily large numbers like we were doing last time. Last time, we were sort of adding them up and we were putting thousands and whatever inside each of these boxes. And that's not what computers can do. They are limited in how the big the number they can represent is. And in the age of the 1980s, where my, my heart still is, the most computers that you could get access to were 8-bit computers. And the 8 bits refers to, essentially, the amount of data that was natural for the computer to deal with at a time. Either the amount it could fetch from memory at one point in time, or the kind of size of numbers that it could add together. Uh, 8 bits in my robot world will be effectively two digits. So I'm not going to use binary because it gets a little bit complicated. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about that, hopefully, if we get time at the end. But as a sort of near enough approximation, what I'm going to do is use two digit numbers. And so really, our little accumulator, it can store from 0, 0, oh, I can't even write, and it can do 0, 1, 0, 2, all the way up to 9, 9. So we get 100 different values. And that's okay. All right. Similarly, our little set of pigeonholes, each one of those uh, um, slots in the pigeonhole can only also store a two-digit number. That seems a bit limiting because Fibonacci numbers grow. If we were, sorry, last time, but we wrote a little program to to generate Fibonacci numbers, so that's where my mind is. But they grow very quickly and they get over 100 pretty swiftly. So the natural trade-off is how can we teach our robot how to do maths involving more than one value at a time so that we can say use four digits by putting the numbers in consecutive pigeonholes. Similarly, our robot can only do simple maths with his abacus involving two two two-digit numbers. Now, how as humans would we add two two two-digit numbers together? Well, actually, the same kind of thing that we do when we're adding any kind of numbers together. Let's say 10 and 33 as a human I start with the right hand. This is at least how I was taught to do it. The kids these days probably have taught something else. Column addition. I think Column it? addition, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and we start yeah. from the right hand side. So I add 0 plus 3, and it gives me 3. And I add 1 and 3, and it gives me 4. And so my answer is 43. And I could just keep doing this. If I had more digits, I could just keep adding them onto this side. So if this was 1,010 and uh, 2133, this would be 31. 43, and so on. So we could keep on making that number arbitrary large, as large as my piece of paper and patience are. I pick these numbers because they're low. What happens if I add, say, 99 with another 99? Well, 9 plus 9 is 18. So in how I'd write it is 8 carry 1. And now we've got, um, this is now a 10. Uh, and then 10 plus 9 is 9. 
And with an extra one, we got one more digit and we had to do a carry operation. It was a carry out of there because we got a bigger number than we could write down in, in any one column. Now our robot's got two columns at a time, um, but we need to teach him how to carry. So we're gonna add some facilities to the robot. He's gonna have a little bit of extra um, state. So at the moment, he's only got an accumulator, the index, which we talked about before, and now we're gonna give him a set of flags. Now, that's a silly name, but it's what they're called, and so I'm gonna kind of go with the metaphor because they're kind of nice as well. And the flags are either raised, little flag that's up, or not raised or down or clear. So we're either clear or set or raised or, or lowered, however you wanna think of it like that. But if you wanna think of them as physical flags, they're raised and lowered. And the robot has about a half dozen of them, the one that we're import we're interested in is the carry flag. And so he has a little flag up here this is my, with a, a C on it, which is probably too sort of small to see. Other flags that the robot might have are zero and negative and overflow and other things like that. And essentially, every time the robot does some arithmetic, he sets the values of these flags according to what happened. So... If he adds two two-digit numbers together and gets a carry, he raises the carry flag, else he makes sure it's put down. And that's his way of remembering, at the back of his head, that if he needed to carry on and do some more arithmetic, then maybe he has to account for an extra, uh, an extra one that we're going to add in. Similarly, the zero flag is set. If the result of what the robot just calculated is zero, the zero flag is set, otherwise it's cleared. The negative is if it goes below zero, which my decimal setup doesn't work very well with, I'll be honest with you, but so I'm gonna gloss over that. Overflow again, more complicated. And there are some other flags that the robot might have that are to do with some of the other things that, that the computer has to deal with. But our carry in this instance lets us write code now that looks a little bit like this. So I'm gonna sort of go back to writing the assembly code, which is the human readable, sort of human readable version of how to add larger numbers together. And so, if, for example, in our Fibonacci, number, uh, Fibonacci program, we wanted to add, uh, say, four digit numbers together, let's make a decision that all of the numbers are gonna be four digits. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use two pigeonholes for every number that's going to be in the sequence. The part before where we were just adding the two prior numbers together to get the next number has to be a little bit more complicated. And I'm not gonna go over the whole program because it's a lot, but we're just gonna write a little bit of how you might add two two digit numbers together. So the first thing I need to do is add the least significant, that is, in our case, the right-hand digit of the number. Now, we get to a, a point where computers have schismed because there are two different ways of doing this. One way is that we store the least significant number first in memory because it's the one you need first if you're about to do arithmetic on it. However, that has the side effect of writing the number backwards in memory. Now, if you never look at the memory, you don't care about that, you always read it consistently. But if you're debugging a program and you're looking at the bytes in memory one after another, the numbers look backwards for some definition of backwards. And so it's convenient for computers, but a pain for humans. Those computers are called little endian because the little, like the least significant part of the number is stored first. So the end of the number is like the little end comes first. Um, as it happens, that seems to have won out. So the the, the, the CPU that we're on here on my, my uh, my laptop is uh, an Intel one, that is little Endian. Uh, most ARM chips are little Endian, they can be configured. Um, but the mainframes of the, of the time were big Endian, they were the other way around. And anyway, so that's little Endian and big Endian as a bonus bit of content in here. <laughs> so anyway, we're gonna store them little Endian. So that means that we're gonna load the first number. So first of all, I need to clear the carry to make sure that whatever had happened before, I don't want to add in an extra from a previous operation. There is no previous operation. And now I'm going to load a value into the accumulator. So I'm going to actually like, let's, let's, do, let's do an actual uh, operation here. Oops, let me get my little index pointer out. And I'm going to draw a little subset over here of the pigeonholes. And we don't even need to know what index these pigeonholes are because it's all relative to this index that we're about to write. So this is the index, which is currently pointing to or referring to the first of the two numbers I want to add together. And I'm gonna put the result over here in these two sections, two little slots over here. Now let's go with some numbers that are actually are Fibonacci. 233 and 377 are some Fibonacci numbers. I think they're 14 and 15, something like that. Okay. So again, in little Endian world, we're gonna store the least significant two digits first. So of the 233, that means I'm gonna write 33 in this first box. And I'm going to write 
zero two in the second box. So again, you can sort of see that it's confusing. It's 233 reading sort of right to left, two digits at a time. And then the next one is uh, 377. Okay, now we wanna add the 33 and the 77 together. So that what I want to do is I wanna refer relative to this index. So while we're here, I'm gonna teach my robot that you don't have to keep moving this index around all the time like we did in the last episode. Um, what we can do is just have relative to this index. So I'm gonna say load the number at the index plus zero, i.e. the one where it's actually pointing at right now. So that would have loaded into our accumulator. Let's get our accumulator, 33. So the number in the accumulator is now 33 and our little carry flag is down. Now we're going to say add, and I'm just because I'm changing this to include a carry, I'm gonna call it add with carry, ADC. Whatever's pointing at X plus two. So rather than moving the index two forward and then two back, as I'm gonna to have to do, I'm just gonna say relative to where the index is, two. So that's gonna get the 77. So 33 plus 77 is, uh, on the spot, three seven is 10. So that gives me a four here. So with a zero, uh, four plus seven is 10. Isn't it 10? No? Yes. No, oh my gosh, it's 110. There we are, okay. So we get 110 out. <laughs> Never do this live. I, have, I wrote these numbers down beforehand and I should have like put the intermediate. So I'll edit episode. all the bits out and it'll look really slick. I look, I look <laughs> like I'm clever, but no, you don't have to edit them out. Everyone can tell me. Like, this is why we have computers to do this yeah, for us. Yeah, yeah, this is it. So 110 doesn't fit into our two digits. So we're left with just the 10 at the bottom, but our carry flag is now raised. So somewhere, and I, I meant to make some little cocktail stick flags to stick up, but... So, Sean, hold up a little flag yeah, for me. Yeah, I'm going to have to, like, do this, right? Hang on, hang on. There we are. Amazing. In fact... <laughs> That's supposed to be a C. One stage, I had a flag like that on my desk, which was an interrupt flag, where people would raise it to say, I'd like to... Interrupt <laughs> Interrupt you. your work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which we could talk about another time. Okay, uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, we've got 10 carry 1. So, we remember the carry. Now, we're going to store that 10, which is the bottom part of our result in x plus four, which is, you know, not one, two, three, four. So we're gonna put 10 in this box. Fantastic, but now we have to do the next part of the calculation and add the most significant parts together. So I'm gonna just quickly write this out. x plus one, add with carry at x plus three, store at x plus five. So working that through, we're going to load the two so our accumulator now has zero, two in it. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna add the three, which would give us five, but the carry flag is set. So we also increment it by another one that gives us six. And is that so carry get, flag, Does it? Is it always gonna be a one? Am I being a fool here? Is it always no, gonna be a absolutely. one? No, absolutely. Yes, there's, if you, if you think about it, what's the largest two numbers that you could add together, it's 99 and 99 mm. and so the, the the largest amount you could ever carry is exactly 100 into the next yes okay i see, I see. Yeah, yeah i know what you mean it feels like you should need more when information you, when you were doing the columns sometimes there was maybe an eight going to no there wasn't there's always no that one, was yeah it? no yes, I, I was just doing long yeah, long no. arithmetic wrong <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> that's fine, why no, you were confused it's all right i'm back with you so we've got oh six in here so now we've got 233 plus 377 is 610, which I really do hope is the next correct uh, Fibonacci number. So that's super cool, right? And you could see how we could extend that arbitrarily to say, well, I want to have 10 digit numbers or 100 digit numbers or so on and so forth. But pragmatically, um, we pick one, two, four, maybe eight, bytes to make a number together. And in modern computers, they can store more than two digits at once. In fact, that's what makes a modern computer so modern. It's like the 8-bit or the 16-bit or 32 or 64-bit-ness of the computer is how many digits it can naturally deal with before it has to start carrying and moving almost. around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can still build these things out um, using those, those operations. But the other sort of key thing about this is that finally, now if you, we, we, we can, Finally, we can stop calculating Fibonacci numbers once we've reached the biggest one we can store. Right. Because if we teach our robot one more trick, 
So if you remember that in our Fibonacci sequence, at the end of this route, the part where we'd added the two together, we would move the index on to the next number. Now we need to move it forward two slots to account for the fact that each number takes up two slots. Mm -hmm. And then we would just jump back to the top and do it again. So we just keep repeating that forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, which is great, right up until it wrote to the, the, the boxes, the pigeonholes that contained the very program that we were executing, in which case, you know, horrible things would happen. But what we can do now is we can say, if we teach the robot, look, you can jump conditionally. So it's a maybe jump. And we say, jump back round. So I'm going to say branch, which is another way of saying jump. Branch, if the carry is clear, back to the top of the loop, which I haven't drawn, but the loop is up here somewhere. And there's some bits missing here as well. It's not important. But this means that instead of always jumping, this is like only jump if the carry is still clear. And the carry would only be clear here if the last piece of arithmetic with the high numbers hadn't also needed yet another byte, another another value. And yeah. so as soon as we get to, uh, was it 10,000, it would stop and say, yeah, okay, this is not representable anymore. I can't fit it. And then we would say, you know, stop here. Or I would say RTS, which would say return subroutine in this language, which means go back to doing whatever you were doing before or halt or something like that. And so now our robot can stop. Yeah. And also, you know, um, you could understand how uh, if you wanted to uh, do other sort of comparisons, you could use arithmetic operations. So, for example, if you wanted to, to do something until two numbers were equal to each other, which is quite common, you just subtract the two numbers that you're interested in. And then if the answer is zero, the zero flag is set. And so that would give me a way of discriminating. You could say jump branch if the zero flag is set. That means the two numbers I just subtracted are the same. And then similarly, if you want to say if one's bigger than the other, if you subtract A from B and B is bigger than A, then the answer you get is negative. So that negative flag will be set. And so you can do all these things. All those comparisons and all the other things that you need to do to sort of do some form of control flow can be built out of the primitives we've got here. Cool. Now, one last thing I wanted to show, and that is to sort of say that, like, I have been slowly morphing what I've been writing down here from a sort of made up instruction for a made up computer into something which looks to most folks a little bit familiar, well not some, some folks a little familiar. And so what I'd like to show just at the end here is if I flick this button over here, what we have here is a BBC Micro running a very slightly tweaked version of the Fibonacci code here. Okay. And in fact, I've got it to also print out the, the uh, uh, machine code that the human readable, human readable, I mean, yeah. it's as readable yeah. as, as we yeah. can get. So if you can see at the top here, the first few lines here are setting up the first two Fibonacci numbers as 0, 0, 0, 1, or 0, 1, 0, 0, I should say, sorry, getting the right way around. And then there is a whole bunch of code here that looks similar, load and add and store, load and add and store, increment and then branch around. This is showing you that a 1980s computer works pretty much exactly the way that we described here. And the, I actually, the, the boxes that I chose to write the Fibonacci numbers in actually are the boxes that correspond to the picture on the screen, which is why at the very top of the screen, you can yeah. see this sort of junky color stuff. Mm -hmm. That is in fact the Fibonacci sequence being interpreted by the video hardware. Ah, okay. Now, being an emulator, I can actually quickly pop in and tell, tell the system, I can go and look directly in the pigeonholes C -O -O, C -O -O. I can't see my computer as a screen at the same time. So now we've looked at the pigeonhole addresses at 7C00. Now, again, I was doing everything in sort of a decimal version of a computer. These are now in hex. So if you just forgive the hexadecimal, we can see that 0100, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, there's the first two numbers, 0, 02, 0, 0, 0, 03, 0, 0, 0, 05, 0, 08, 0, D, that's 13 and so on, and somewhere in there, we will find the hex representation of 610, if we do it right. But there are the actual pigeonholes in a real computer, real, real from the 1980s <laughs> computer. An emulated real computer in- An yeah. emulated, <laughs> running in a web browser of all things. So yeah, you know, we've really come full circle here. Now each of these bits has a number associated with it. So this would be considered bit zero, and this would be considered bit 31. And then we can count down, so this is then a bit... So, sometimes, the way this is done by some...